I just want to hear kind of the same kind of thing about Andres. You remember him, of course. Yeah. So let her lead, because from a child's perspective, I think would be really interesting about. Uh, okay. Well, I first started learning about Jerry Andres from Ray. Ray, we talked about this. It's an amazing man. He knew his friend Jerry, who, could, who had this amazing house, the Castle of Chaos in Albany, that he had all wired up with surveillance technology, which was a big day deal in those days. You could just buy that stuff at the spy store, and he made all these optical illusions. And strange food preferences. And that, I remember you told me about the cards that Jerry had made about how he wanted his eggs burned in multiple yeah, languages. He got, he got a translation. I still have a translation. When he went to Japan, uh, he was invited to Japan by the magician there. They want to give lectures and stuff. And he, so before he went to Japan, he found a translator. Because he, he, Jerry, like everything had to be burned. He ate charcoal, basically. So, uh, was, so he would, you know, people had a, I had a, when he in restaurants with him, he would tell the waiter, he's a very nice guy, not to upset people. He says, look, I'm going to tell you this. I'm, I want my meat well done. I want it almost burned. And he, I says, I know when you're going to bring it back. He tell the waiter, I know when you bring it to me, it's not going to be as well done as I want it. I'm going to have to send it back, but don't you feel bad about it. <laughs> and it sure would happen that way, and he'd send it back until he really got it, basically charcoal. And uh, he knew he was going to have trouble in uh, Japan, because especially breakfast, he loved to have eggs, but, but he could, couldn't stand any, uh, any drippy eggs or, or, or liquidy. So he'd like to have his eggs. solid eggs that weren't yeah, leathery. That they, uh, so his eggs had to be absolutely solid and burned through. So he knew in Japan he was going to have trouble with that. So he got a translator here, he got a Japanese person here that he knew. Magician actually, and he had the guy write out in Japanese for him a uh, card that, that I want my eggs really burnt. That they're going to be really burnt, or I'm going to send them back. They're going to be really brown, not only brown but almost black on the uh, each side. And he had the other things like that. So he told me the first day he went to Japan. The first morning he went, went to get to have breakfast in the hotel he was in, and he gives this thing to the waiter, and the waiter looks at it, and pretty soon. Jerry knows it now. People are sticking, licking, looking out the kitchen. There's a chef with his uh, uh, hat on and a couple other people and the waiter, and they're all looking, they're pointing at him, they're looking at this thing, pointing at him. <laughs> they couldn't believe they didn't want to burn the eggs, you know. Uh, and they finally brought him his eggs, but they were not that well done, so he had to send them back again. <laughs> and uh, but he, but he, there's a lot of adventures to talk about, but. but yeah, he did have very interesting food. But, but it was simple if you could get it. Chapels. Yeah. One of the things I remember about Jerry was his absolute reliance on being, everyone being honest. He had to be absolutely honest. He wouldn't tolerate dishonesty. To the extent that once at a meeting in Chicago, he was in the hallway just doing some magic for people. And he had a woman pick a card, had her put it back on top of the deck, and then his face down, he was about to take the card and put it in the deck. He said, I'm going to bury the card now. And she said, is that still my card? <laughs> and he said, please don't ask me that question. <laughs> the other thing I remember about Jerry was his incredible energy. He loved to go to conferences. And he would seemingly be up. I thought I liked to stay up pretty late. But he seemed to be awake almost 24 hours a day and set up his illusions in the lobby of the hotel and meet people. And you know, he was just constantly on the go. He just enjoyed talking to people and enjoyed Well, he prided himself on being the last person to go to bed at any conference. He also liked, liked to do it in the wee hours of the morning. He liked to find people and have an argument. No matter what side they're on, he wanted to have an argument. He loved to love argue. Uh, and, and, uh, and just loved arguments. Uh, religion, you name it, he just loved it, argue. And I remember one time, I used to, we used to room together at the hotels, and uh, he knew I liked to go to bed relatively early. So he always would try to come in, you know, very, not wake me up when he came into the room. He usually wake in wee hours of the morning. But I remember one time he came back relatively early, like those two rather than six in the morning or something like that. He comes sneak, sneak in the room, and I woke up and I said, Jerry, this is early. And he almost was crying. He says, you know, I couldn't find anyone to argue with. <laughs> There's a sad spritz I've ever seen. You couldn't find anyone to argue. 
kind of thing. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was wasn't never a hostile kind of. Oh no no he's a, no Jerry was not a hostile person. No, he respected me. You know, but I went that the uh, I thought the best thing there have been two documentaries done on Jerry's life. And the last one I thought was excellent because what the guy did, Robert Neary, uh, what he did was he found some people to talk about Jerry who were fundamentalist religious people. And Jerry was an atheist, out and out, out atheist, you know. And, and he he didn't he was very respectful of them when he when he I he made his views clear, but he was very respectful, he didn't want to hurt them or anything. And it was nice these people were saying that, you know, uh, it's too bad he didn't give Jesus into him because he's gonna go to hell and he doesn't such a good guy shouldn't go to hell. But still maybe God will make an exception for him. The other thing they ever said was that what I thought was interesting, what they got across in this documentary on Jerry was that even though he was an atheist, there are people who had views diametrically opposite his, very fundamental views of people who thought he was a wonderful person. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was nice. That was like Jerry's story of his out of body experience, too. He was a yeah. lineman for Oregon Hydro for many years, and that was one of the most amazing things about him that he was completely self taught in everything he did from biblical scholarship and criticism to sleight of hand magic to optical illusions. He discovered all these things that famous people and psychologists had won major awards for. He just made them up himself in his castle chaos in Albany. But uh, I just I just love the story about the time that he was explaining some safety procedure to some guys who worked on his crew. And he had explained it to them so many times before and he was so frustrated that they were not picking up that suddenly he had this out-of-body experience of looking down on himself, telling, telling them the same thing. And like later on in adulthood, I had sort of understood what he was talking about. So, yeah, how did he reconcile that with his skepticism? He just said that, you know, he, he didn't think it was supernatural at all. He just thought that, you know, his mind had just taken a vacation from the mundane reality of talking to these guys about the same thing over and over again. And his brain was just kind of entertaining himself. Jerry spent a lot of time training himself. He was very fascinated by, um, uh, what do you call those kind of dreams? That, uh, lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming, yes. He trained himself to do lucid dreaming. That's lucid dreaming is where you know you're dreaming and you you why you're aware of it as you direct it. Right? You direct yeah. it. What's that? You direct it. You That's share right. your yeah. own dream. So he trained himself, he worked very hard to train himself to do lucid dreaming. He would read up on it. He was fascinated by all kinds of tricks of the mind. That's all why, why illusions fascinate him as well. So he was, he was just unbelievably like a cognitive psychologist, even though he never studied it. I could bring him to my classes in cognitive psychology. He would talk about his theories about how we see and how we fill in things and so on. And it was just right in line with the latest in cognitive psychology. But it was on his own. He did it on his own. He figured it out on his own. Jim, do you ever hear anyone speak an old word of Jerry Andrews? No, Jerry was the kind of person that everybody liked. You couldn't help but like him. And he was always so respectful of others. You know, even if he disagreed with people, he, he did it in a nice way. When I mean disagree, he would disagree, for example, he used to get upset if you were in a cafeteria and you were sitting beside him and you didn't finish your plate of food. He thought that was <laughs> sinful. Uh, he, he, might, he might look at you, he might stare at your plate, he might say something, but he would never make you feel embarrassed. It was, uh, you always walked away thinking, well, he's got high standards. You know? Well, let me, let me tell you how this could backfire a lot, too, though. Uh, he always, oftentimes, you know, we were together so often in, in, at conventions and stuff like that. Oftentimes, we'd be watching a magician uh, doing his stuff, and sometimes the magician would ask us to watch because he wanted to see, uh, he'd get uh, tips from us or something like that. And um, so, uh, many, many times I remember sitting beside Jerry and he whispered to my, to my ear and said, Oh, he doesn't ask us. So now, if they were on our time, but I don't know how many you've heard of Max Maven. Okay, well, Max came uh, out many years ago, came out to visit Jerry at his Magic Castle because he was performing in Portland, Oregon. He was doing a show there. And he asked us to come up to watch the show. And for some reason, I couldn't, I guess I would have had some other obligation. But Jerry went up to Portland and watched the show. It was in a nightclub there, I guess. And uh, as Jerry told to me, he said, you know, he knows Max as a great magician, a great mind reader, he, 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 he's wonderful, and he 
thought he was doing tricks that were beneath him. Well, he did mostly card stuff, mental card stuff. Jerry didn't think that was too good. And he was playing that, you know, that, that Max, because Max said, ask him to come to get, get his opinion. He was hoping he wouldn't ask him. But, so I don't know what Jerry said to Max, but I got a phone call because Max Maven then went from Portland to Seattle. Steve Mitch is a, a well-known uh, 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 magician, but he, he runs the best, he publishes books of magic, which I play, I love magic. And Steve's a good friend of Jerry's and mine. I got a phone call from Steve Mitch from Seattle, and saying, Ray, what did Jerry do to poor Max? I said, what did Jerry do to poor Max? Max is a tough cookie, you don't do anything to Max. And Jerry would never do anything to him, him to her. He says, well, and this is the story he told me. He says, uh, Max said uh, he asked Jerry's opinion about how he had done after a show. And he said Jerry hesitated. And then Jerry said, Max, you have a wonderful voice. <laughs> Kept it positive. <laughs> well, because Max was really yeah. distracted out, but Jerry was trying to be right. <laughs> yeah, tell the uh, girl being cut in half story. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, because Jerry was so known for his carrying out being truthful and being honest to the utmost, uh, Di Vernon, uh, Di Vernon was the dean of magic for many years. Uh, all magicians called him the, the professor. He was the standard magician and he was the in-house magician at the Magic Castle for many years. And Di Vernon used to tell a story about a magician who used to do the old-fashioned sawing in half illusion. You saw a woman in half and you split it up and the legs are there and her torso and heads there in this box. And uh, he's talked about this magician who did that illusion. He did it for matinees and did an evening show. And one of his matinees, his female assistant who plays the legs, was not there. And in desperation, this magician put a male assistant in the box, bottom box play the role of the legs, basically. And so then, during the show, the magician saw the women in half, separated the two halves, you know, in the box, and said, ladies and gentlemen, over here we have her head, and over here we have his feet. <laughs> 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 and that means Jerry Anders was the magician, he said. <laughs> but Jerry never did that. It was just that, a story. No, Jerry never did. No, just, just, it was a, story. just a story to explain. He, he made the story up to illustrate Jerry's character, you know, epitomized Jerry. No, Jerry never did any stage magic at all, ever, but, but the, this is the way he used to tell the story to, to get across Jerry's compulsive honesty. Yeah, compulsive honesty, that's a good way of putting it.